Ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters, mark your calendar for the Church of God in Christ Virtual Church Growth and Development Forum. July 12th, 7 o'clock p.m. Eastern Standard Time, 6 o'clock p.m. Central Standard Time with International Director Bishop Roderick L. Hennings, Vice President Pastor Terry Ellison, and Board Members Bishop Mark Yoki, Pastor Derek Hutchins Jr., Pastor Raymond Watson, Pastor Will Nichols, and Pastor Sam Moore. A forum for pastors and leaders to expand your reach and learn how to keep what you catch as fishers of men. You don't want to miss it. July 12th, 7 o'clock p.m. Eastern Standard Time, 6 o'clock p.m. Central Standard Time. The Virtual Church Growth and Development Forum. Good evening, good evening, and praise the Lord around the world. We are excited and ecstatic, really, about this first uh, Church Growth and Development virtual forum with some exciting minds from across the country. I'm certainly excited about these mighty men of God. And uh, this department is more so about developing your church, developing your administration, and really learning how to keep what you can. Evangelism is a different department. We want to show you how to actually maintain the fish that you've caught and to close the back door of your church while you keep the front door open. We have some exciting men of God on here with us tonight, and we're giving a shout out to everybody around the country. I have already saw uh, some people from Africa on here. Thank God for them from, from Pakistan. Praise God for them from Pakistan. Praise God for them from the Ivory Coast. That is absolutely exciting. Our, 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 our board is here tonight, and uh, we're going to, it's going to be an interactive session. Church Growth and Development is an interactive session. And pastors, let me say to you that are listening, uh, this, is, this is no indictment on your preaching ability. We don't have a preaching problem. We have a keeping problem. Mm -hmm. We want to be able to maintain that. I'm Roger Hennings. I am the founding pastor of Zion Dominion Global Ministries with one church in multiple locations. And the Lord has blessed us. And I was appointed as a church growth and development director under the leadership of uh, the former presiding bishop, Bishop Emeritus, Bishop Charles Blake. And I was reappointed by our presiding bishop, uh, Bishop J. Drew Shear. Uh, and I praise God that I am an auxiliary bishop in the Church of God Christ. And I'm excited about serving in this Pentecostal environment. And you're going to hear a brief bio of these men, so you'll see that they're well capable and qualified to share tonight. Well, I'm Pastor Terry Ellison. I'm excited to be with you guys tonight. I'm the pastor of uh, one church in seven locations in Montgomery, Alabama, and also the pastor of New Lake Birmingham in Birmingham, Alabama. I'm excited. I was appointed as vice president uh, of the church growth department and uh, by Bishop Sheard. I'm so excited to be working with such a great leader and actually a great team of men. We're going to really be talking about some great things tonight. I'm excited. I want you to uh, delve in and let's enjoy each other and just have a good conversation. Wonderful. Yes, I'm Bishop Mark Gilkey, the jurisdictional prelate of, prelate of Kansas Southwest jurisdiction. Um, been married for 32 years to Verdina Gilkey. Praise the Lord. One wife. Praise God. Amen. And, um, we have served in many, many, many areas in the church, um, from the YPWW to the music department to just various areas, the plethora of areas in the church. Uh, nationally, we serve on the uh, Agreements Committee for Bishop Board of Bishops, uh, Assistant Regional Bishop here in the Midwest area, Standards and uh, Extensions Committee, um, founder of the Agape Fellowship Church of God in Christ in 1995. Uh, my father, who was Bishop J.C. Gilkey, we merged the ministry as Pastor in 2008 at the time of the 50 active uh, ministries going on with the pandemic. You know, there's been some shifting, but all the ministry, most of the ministry were yet very, very active. Also, in, in our, under our ministry, we have the SMC Family Life Center, which is a 501c3 program, a nonprofit organization formed out of our, the cathedral here where we serve the Metro Wichita community. Um, worked in corporate America as a bank manager, president for 20 years. And we're just excited to be a part of whatever we can do to help our church become the church and your church to be what it should be. God bless Wonderful. you. Wonderful. Pastor Sam Moore. Thank you, Bishop. I'm excited to be here to all of those who are joining us. If you haven't, as of yet, please share us to uh, this distinguished panel. Thank you for allowing me to be a part. I am Pastor Sam Moore out of Detroit, Michigan. 
And I pastor a church uh, called Conqueror's Church, uh, one of the fastest growing churches in our area here. Uh, the Lord is blessed. And uh, I've been married 27 years and I have three children. Uh, our focal point in our ministry will be three prongs, communication, connection, then conversion. We want to make sure that we're the best at communicating what we, what uh, our events are, what we're all about. Then we want to connect people, get people into the life of the church. Of course, then, of course, as we're doing that, we want to convert them. We're going to have a great time tonight. Again, please share, and it's going to be exciting. You're going to love it. God bless. Pastor Derek Hutchins is the second. Pastor Derek Hutchins. God bless you, Pastor Derek Hutchins II, third generation Church of God in Christ, pastor of the Christ Believers Ministries in Columbia, South Carolina, serving in the youth department for approximately 22 years. And I'm a proud leader and servant of God in the Church of God in Christ in various capacities with pastors and elders council uh, during the time of, of Father's uh, ten years chairman, uh, Bishop Derek W. Hutchins II, and it's been a joy to serve in various areas of ministry uh, throughout our jurisdiction of South Carolina. <coughs> AIM chairman uh, for 14 years, youth president for 22 years, and now serving as one of the leaders uh, as a director of operations for the South Carolina jurisdiction Church of God in Christ, uh, approximately 74 churches in our jurisdiction. It's a joy to serve. Wonderful, Pastor Raymond Watson. Good evening, everyone. I'm Pastor Raymond Watson. I'm the pastor of Steadfast Church of God in Christ in Stewart's Draft, Virginia. Um, it is a kind of small rural church, but I'm totally convinced that God needs good pastors in urban, suburban, rural. He needs good pastors everywhere. Um, I was, uh, by vocation, I served as the assistant to the president and chief operating officer of the Billy Graham Association. Um, they flew me to some different parts of the world and I got to see a lot and do a lot. And I told God I would bring back what I saw and learned back to the church that I grew up in. Um, I have 15 years of nonprofit management. So I know um, something about how to motivate and inspire um, volunteers, which most of our churches have. And so I've just compiled a number of different training materials. I'm a published author. And I'm just excited about what uh, we have to offer to the body of Christ. I think those who are listening, you are going to hear some things that uh, are just going to bless you and help you to become uh, better at what you do. Wonderful. Pastor Will Nichols. God bless you, Bishop, and all the saints of God. I'm Pastor Will Nichols, superintendent of the Greater Triangle District, pastor of one of the greatest churches down here in Raleigh, Durham, North Carolina. My uh, dad is the late great uh, uh, Bishop William Nichols out of Western Michigan. My mother is the current state supervisor in Western Michigan. And my pastor is one of the best bishops in the world, Bishop Patrick Lane Wooden of NC Third Jurisdiction. And they are in the house. Oh, I'm excited on it tonight. You talk about learning how to keep what you catch. Yeah. I've been on that journey. We just celebrated 23 years. My wife, Dr. Grace Nichols, and I started our church in our living room, and we grew. We built a multi-million dollar facility, got up to about 2,000 members, and, and then we hit a wall and the street dropped down. Maybe we have about four or 500 now, Bishop, but one of the things that I'm on is how do you keep what you didn't catch? Ah. How do you keep that? And this is going to be powerful we are our premise right now we went to a growth group uh, uh lecture lab model with our church uh, and our model is to grow closer with god and to foster long-term christ-centered relationships so we shifted our focus and it's been a blessing especially during this pandemic that's wonderful well you can see we have a qualified uh, uh staff and a board to work in church growth uh I was just thinking about the years combined with our pastoring, and it's, it's well over, it's well over a hundred years combined. Oh, sure. Yeah. And that's, I mean, uh, I've been pastoring thirty years. My wife and I had 
uh, began the church. And my wife is the COO, Pamela D. Hennings. She's my wife for life. I love and adore. We just celebrated, man, uh, 33 years. Wow. So really about that. I'm really excited about that. Maybe so one of, the, one of the dynamics, uh, brothers, that that out of concerned pastors from across the country, we had a, uh, a little think tank and were able to con con uh, really to collect a collaboration of uh, views and opinions and concerns from pastors. And one of the uh, main concerns was that we focused on urban church, but not rural church. Mm. Mm. Uh, that is a, a concern for many pastors. And, you know, according to the Barna Group, uh, a, a, a average size church, an average church size is between 35 to 50 members. That's average. Mm. So you, you, you're considered average if your church is 35 to 50 members. Uh, less than that is considered a small church. But uh, most importantly, we're dealing, not only are we dealing multicultural, we're dealing multi-generational. This is one of the, uh, the concerns that some of the pastors had. And uh, I wanted you brothers to chime in on, because uh, some, of, some of us here have, have had and do have urban ministries and connected to, to uh, pastors that you're imparting into uh, the, the urban dynamic versus the rural dynamic, because some here have dealt with rural ministry. So you can just chime in on this uh, at any point on that. Well, Bishop, I, um, you know, we're pastoring here, right here in the uh, city of Durham, North Carolina. It, I, I guess I would consider it an urban community right next to Raleigh. Uh, my Bishop Patrick Wooden is in the next city over, and we both have ministries here in the, uh, uh, what I would call uh, the, the urban area. But as a superintendent, I pastor, uh, uh, I superintend several guys who are in smaller communities. And so their whole community may not even have but a thousand people in it. Wow. So, so you know then that you, you can't look at a mega church and, and run your church that way when you're in a community that everybody in there been going to the same search since Mama and, and Papa. Yeah, yeah. And, and, uh, but, and, and, I, and what I share with my pastors is you've got to know who you've called and what you're called to do. Exactly. You look at an urban church, you got to understand the dynamics of where you are. And one of the things that I've learned, uh, a Bishop, is that whether you're called to a thousand or called to a hundred, the gospel is still the same. The approach may be different, but the gospel is still the same. And if you can get people to focus on God's word and connect with each other, because even in our church, we've tried to break our larger church down into what I would consider small rural churches. We call them cell groups. But yeah, I, want to, I want to get I want to get to that cell group piece, but I don't want to I don't want to let the cat out the bag on that. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, but yeah, that's my experience is just telling the pastors don't don't look at a man with a thousand members in a big city or ten thousand members in a big city and feel bad. Uh, pastor your twenty, pastor your twenty five, and just be good at that. God gave us the same same response. Well done, now good and faithful right. servant. You know, incidentally, if, if you have a thousand members or more, you're in one tenth of one percent of all churches. Mm. Wow. Even though you see mega churches on television, uh, the truth of the matter is that's one tenth of one percent of all churches. The right. other thing that you can't sleep on, and this is a good caveat for many that are listening now, is that the post pandemic, you realize that your church is not measured by the people who sit in your pews. <laughs> Your virtual church, for many of us, is larger than the actual people that are in person services. So I think that's very, very important. I saw someone uh, wanted to chime in on that. Well, I can well, tell Bishop, you, Pastor Watson. Okay, Pastor yeah. I can tell you from personal experience because I am a pastor of a rural church. Mm. Um, he opened the uh, back door one Sunday might be some goats across the road <laughs> back door the next one day might be some sheep across the road maybe 7500 yards you open the door the next day um it might be something else out there but what i've come to understand is that the word of god is the same you know second timothy 2 and 2 tells us that and the things that thou has heard of me among many witnesses the same 
commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. And so I'm finding out that the principles are, we just have to have good um, teaching in place so that that can be kind of exponentially uh, sent out. And you, you find that when the teaching is good, it has a, a, a multiplicity effect to where it begins to impact um, mama, papa, I think I heard. Yeah. Uh, but that's what you need because it's going to be the, most of the, the smaller rural churches are family churches. And so there is a dynamic that goes along with that. And I, I, that's why I'm excited about being part of this because I know somebody's out there thinking, well, you know, I know him and him and him. They have large churches. What about small churches? Well, we did not um, overlook that. And we're going to have some great, powerful uh, principles and tools to be able to share with even the small rural churches. I'm excited. This is, this is actually a toolbox and, and uh, we're, wow. we can open the top slowly as we uh, go into this before Pastor Moore uh, comes on. Church growth is not so much about numerical growth, it's about the health of your church, mm. the health of your church. You can have you can have a hundred people that are fat, faithful and teachable. And that that fat group can change the community because of their fidelity to the ministry, not only having the Holy Ghost, the Haggion Numa, but having your spirit as the leader. Pastor Sam. Thank you, Bishop. So you, your question was pertaining to that rural uh, inner city or that urban. So I guess I'm like in the middle. I am a suburban church. But here's the thing. I am a transplant suburban church. We were initially in the inner city. On, and if you know Detroit, those around the world, I mean, around the country know Detroit is a very church heavy town, church heavy town. We were on one of those church rolls, if you will. Uh, <laughs> but the Lord blessed and uh, we were led of the Lord to transplant. But here's the thing that, I, you know, the scripture says this, Matthew 4. It says that the Lord is called and he wants us to be fishers of men. So what I did is I spent some time with a fisherman, a professional fisherman to just learn tactics in terms of fishing. And then I applied the principle to people. And uh, some of what he shared uh, is what I've been implementing in my suburban church, if you will. And uh, it all uh, places itself as, I believe it was you, Bishop, who said this, Bishop Hennings, that is, said, we are all given a voice as speakers and as pastors, as preachers. And that voice resonates with a certain person or type of person. And I think that that is going to be key. You've got to identify who your voice resonates to That's and true. begin to speak to that. Don't try to duplicate others. Speak to who your voice reaches. And, and, and that's what the Lord has blessed me to be able to do. Vice President Terry Ellison. Yes, sir. You well, you know, uh, the first church, I, I've never taken over a church. I started every one of that of a pastor. And the first one was a, a very modern well, back home in the country, rural area. Mm. Um, very discouraging because I, uh, I was raised in a rural area, but I found out that going into a rural area, uh, starting a church, it was very difficult because everybody was well established in the neighborhood and everybody belonged to a certain kind of church and it was kind of hard uh, unless you were trying to get somebody from somebody's church to even get a member. And so that was a very discouraging uh, moment for me, and and uh, and it, it was really uh, uh, it really hurt. I, I got hurt in the process because I was expecting so many things for God to do, and those things just wasn't happening as quick as I thought they should have. And so what I ended up doing is um, uh, 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 learning uh, valuable lessons as I left that church. I, I, I it's, the church still exists, but I left that church, and it and it's it's thriving right now. But we laid a foundation of prayer and fasting. Uh, me, a young minister, not really being trained to be a pastor, just having the desire to do so. Uh, but I found out what I was in the process of being trained for what was coming next. Yeah. Uh, and uh, it, it was just a, a, a different, a very, very disappointing time. When I look back at it now, it taught me uh, a, a, something about weathering storms. You never know the power of your church until you weather the storm. Ah, that's good. Good. That's good. That's good, sir. That's, that's good. good. We appreciate that. Bishop Gilkey? Well, first and foremost, um, I think being spiritual, that's the number one thing. 
uh, prayer has been the key to success uh, to our ministry. We're not necessarily in a, uh, a, a rural area, but I want to big piggyback on what a bit, uh, Superintendent Nichols said about those live group and support groups. We've, I found that to be so helpful to our ministry uh, here, especially during the pandemic. Uh, with the live group, what you can do, we, we specialize in certain areas of ministries. And by doing so, what we've done also is open it up, opening it up not just to the local ministry, but individuals from across the country begin to join in with our uh, some of our, our life groups from South Carolina. We're in Kansas. We have people from South Carolina, different places who join our life groups. And even in your rural area or large city, you can open up that life group. And what that will do, that will help to introduce your ministry to individuals in that rural area or across the country or however you will, will want to do that. But those life groups have been so uh, critical and important to the life of our ministry because we specialize in certain areas, whether it's single mothers or whether it's uh, divorce groups or what have you. So it's a wonderful tool for uh, the in in growth in in-house and also reaching out. So I think that's a powerful tool to use in your community to, to invite others and introduce them to be a part of your ministry. Those life groups are extremely powerful. Oh, Bishop, I want to say this too. Uh, what I had to do when I was in a rural church, uh, what I failed to do at the beginning of it, is learn the language. Uh, mm, there's a language that the rural area is speaking, mm. everyone is different, and you got to learn the language. You know, uh, uh, people don't realize that John the Baptist was a rural preacher. He was uh. in rural areas. Uh, he And he was very successful. When he came to the city, he lost his head. Mm. Because he, he didn't know the story. <laughs> <laughs> what are you trying to say, Superintendent? What are you trying to say? <laughs> right. So you really got to know the language of, of who you're addressing and understand the culture. Uh, yes, because uh, even different parts of town and me having one church in seven locations, none of the communities are the same. They're all different. So we had to go in and learn the culture. Yeah, that's true. Community. That's true. I remember uh, right now, our church is suburban. I actually started our church in the city of Buffalo. And we bought a 14-acre campus in Amherst. And then in our Rochester location, we had a 50-acre campus. And that was a rural place. I was in a city called Rush, and it was urban. And I wanted to find out how I can reach them. As a matter of fact, we had neighbors who I, I bordered. Uh, I, I uh, uh, did commerce with them, exchanging of goods and services. I said, look, if you plow this campus, you can hunt the turkey and the deer on 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 on, on the acreage, mm -hmm. and a lot of those guys were farmers, and so I couldn't just minister to them to try to just get them to come to church. But uh, what I did was we, we made knockers and put them on the doors and said, "We're going to be praying for your harvest." Mm -hmm. Some of those uh, farmers yeah. came by and they they called me father. Father, we came for the prayer for our harvest. <laughs> oh, <laughs> wow. So it's, it's you can't have what's called indiscriminate dissipation and just fish everywhere. I'm trying to catch everybody. Yeah, it's yeah. Gonna work. It's just not going to work. Mm -hmm. It's an investment that all of us have to make, and especially the 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 up and coming pastors. The musician is not your number one investment. Your number one investment is a secretary. <laughs> your number <laughs> one investment. The root of the word secretary is secret. That person helps you move to that church and. And find out who's bouncing checks, uh, who's causing trouble, and they can still be sanctified because they're working directly with you. So, Bishop, can I can I chime in right there? Because uh, unlike you and uh, several of the our panel here uh, of you guys who have uh, major ministries that uh, have um, budgets that can uh, uh, handle those add-ons in terms of um, uh, uh, salaries for secretaries and administrators and things of this nature uh i guess my specialty is my team is fully volunteer and what i've come to understand as well as you that secretary that administrator is is super super vital so then i guess the question comes how do you onboard a secretary when you don't have the budget because i think that a lot of pastors are, are having that struggle they would like to do that yeah. but it is kind of difficult and what I have found is I use the team concept. What I've done is I have spread out, equaled out the responsibility among a team. That way, no one is overworked and I can still get the assignments done yeah. that I need to get done and don't have that enormous overhead of a salary on me. 
That, that's good. I want to pose a question uh, to the panel, uh, but I, I agree with you, Pastor Moore. Um, generally, when you when you when you don't have it in your budget at the church that I pastor, I hired people who would do it for nothing. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah we have about twenty two employees, but I hired people who would do it for nothing. It was people that have the burden of the ministry versus people that have the glory of the ministry. Yeah. There's a question about dealing with the multiculturalism and how do you deal specifically with Latinos, somebody says such as themselves. Uh, for me, uh, generally, you don't draw what you want, you draw what you are. What you are, that's right. You, if you want to see Latinos, you want to see Russians, you want to see Bangladesh people, uh, they gotta be a part of your usher board and your praise team. People gotta have to be able to see themselves. That's right. That's what worked in our church. That's Brothers, right. I'm right in on that. And that's called the law of attraction. You attract who you are. Yeah. Right. Law of influence and magnetism. Um, so that we have to pray and that's got to help us that we can be more open to uh, what he would have for us to attract. So if you want those type of individuals, you have to, as someone said, you got to prepare to receive them. If they come, you can't really minister to them because you don't know the, their culture or their language as such. So the law of attraction, we attract who we are. And normally, if you're, many of you are very talented, so you attract the people who are gifted and talented. I, I attract several people who are just gifted and talent, talented, so I have to keep them on the altar praying because gifted and talented people have to stay busy. But yeah. the law of attraction is what you're speaking of, and, and that's something that we have to work on within ourselves. If we want to attract a different audience, we must prepare for the audience that we desire to attract. Yeah, people definitely have to see themselves in your church. They have to. Sure. The, the, the one one thing that I've struggled with is multicultural churches, and y'all excuse me if I ain't supposed to say this. I'm gonna go ahead and say it. The most of the multicultural churches that I see, where our people go, we are not the head. The opinions of Pastor Will Nichols are not the reflection of. I, my door is open for anybody and everybody. I say, come on. As a matter of fact, Bishop, that was my motto, a church for all people. Yeah. And uh, I heard somebody say, you can't fish everywhere. And I was trying. I remember I spent a whole lot of money mm. on a, a white radio station trying to get folks to come to my uh, daycare. And uh, it was like, it was a good commercial. But I got three calls. I put the same commercial on a black station and got a hundred calls. Yeah. The ninjas knew who I was. Okay, yeah. stop. Yeah. Oh my God. Stop, stop. <laughs> <laughs> Come back, Pastor. Come back. We need I love it. I love oh. it. I love it. But that, that is a point. Uh, again, you really don't have, you really don't have uh, uh, reconciliation when you just have uh, black people attending white church with white leadership. And, they, and, and because real recon reconciliation is when white people submit to black leadership. Yeah, Bishop yeah. didn't turn me off. I thought Bishop tried to try to, try to disconnect me. No, no, no. I, I was just being open, Bishop. <laughs> but here's what, Who just took the blows after you were <laughs> But Bishop, here's what I found. I've just accepted the pond that God has put me in. Mm. And I'm doing everything I'm learned how to do to do that. Mm. And the one thing that I did, Bishop, was I, I disabused, well, actually God disabused me of the idea uh, and you said this earlier, of trying to get more and more and more and more people. Yeah. He said, Will, I didn't call you to get people to sign up to go to church. I called you to feed my sheep. Uh. Now, whoever I've called you and send you to, you make sure that those people are growing. And that's when we changed our model, Bishop. I stopped trying to get everybody. And I just said, Lord, thank you for the fish that you sent me. Now show me how to connect them. And we went from people just being casual. What's up, Doc? What's up, Doc? What's up, Doc? To becoming very transparent when we went to our group model. Because people started to get to know each other. Because when you got hundreds of people, it's hard for people to connect. But when you break it down to tens, you can't hide in the corner anymore. You got to open up. That's and true. that's what we did, Bishop. And it changed us. It brought us through this pandemic. 
but I, I stopped looking at these mega churches and like uh, uh, that all I'm getting is these few people. I stopped doing it. I just said, mm -hmm. Lord, thank you for it. the fish that you gave me as such as the Lord has prepared. Uh, you know, I will be thankful. And I just said, okay, God, if you want white folks to come, I'm open. You yeah. want Latinos to come, I'm open. But I thank you for these brothers and sisters that show up with their tithes and offering every Sunday. Absolutely. <laughs> you know, Bishop, can I say this? Sure, sure. Um, my personal experience, uh, I worked for three years, uh, full-time paid staff for a church that was 47% Black, 47% Hispanic, and 6% other. Wow. And I found out, and like I said, I stayed there three years. I was the um, associate pastor of leadership, and I just had a bunch of ministries under me. But what I found out was that Black folks, white folks, Hispanics, Asians, all of them have problems and all of them can be a problem if you don't, <laughs> if you don't teach them, train them, um, usher in the anointing. Sure. What I'm saying is <laughs> the, pr the principles will work. Um, I heard somebody say on TV is like Novocaine. When you put the principles in right, just give it a little time. It'll work. You just yeah. have to make sure that you that, that the training is sound, the doctrine what, is sound. What is one of the principles? <laughs> Give us one of the principles. Well, again, one of, with this just group one. that I worked with, um, we had in leadership, we had uh, Caucasian, African American, Asian. Okay, stop right there. Hispanic. That's, people had the chance to see themselves. Right. That's right. That's mm -hmm. the principle. You got to yep. see it. That's right. Six, six pastors um, with five different nationalities. Mm. What that means is, is Pastor, Pastor, uh, Pastor say more as soon as I finish and they go to Pastor sure. Elson. What that means is you got to be willing to lose control to grow. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You got to be willing to lose control to grow. And be intimidated. That's right. Which calls for a, a strong level of security and be willing to be vulnerable in order for you to lose control so things can grow. Sam, Pastor Sam Moore. So thank you, Bishop. I, uh, that's a powerful thing. So I pastor a multiracial church. I like to call it still one culture. Um, but, you know, I had to face a brutal fact, right? Uh, it, it is it is true. It's, to it's totally true. Uh, in our brother and sister churches, when it's white led, our people tend to uh, navigate or uh, they tend to connect better than when it's black led. OK, so what I did and this was a practical move we, I did, it was intentional. I had secret shoppers, white, specifically secret shoppers attend my church. And I had to deal with the brutal facts of why and how was my church being presented? My church was being presented like it wasn't welcoming to them. It was being presented like it was a club, like it was just us. And so hmm, I had to adjust. That's one, I think, that a principle that is key. Two, I would say this, and you just shared it, Bishop. You gotta, they gotta see themselves. It's gotta be in your team. It's gotta be reflective in your team. And I'm not talking about just front people. I'm talking about some decision makers. I put them on my doors. Um, they're rocking sign rockers when people come in. They're on the stage with announcements. It's a number of things that I'm engaging, intertwining them in the uh, service floor of our ministry so they see themselves. You know, um, you know, I was telling you how discouraging it was at, when I started in the rural area because God had given me such a larger vision. And um, and in the vision he showed me, I saw thousands of, of people that were multicultural. I saw all races there. <coughs> and, um, and then when God told me to start a church in Montgomery, he said that it would be one church in seven locations. And and he showed me uh, this, and many people said it would never work. We never heard of that. And I had no point of reference. The reference that I did have is what Bishop Mason had said, that uh, because we're a church of God in Christ, I, I, I began to draw on the heritage that we that started the church. And one thing I got from his daughter that said, it says uh, he told, that God told Bishop Mason, uh, if you turn yourself over to me and let me make a man out of you. No place wow. where you'll never be able to hold those who will follow you. And so we are the children of Bishop Mason. And so being the children of Bishop Mason, I embrace that. I, I embrace uh, uh, because 
I used to always be, be glad when the district meeting came so we can have a larger crowd when the state meeting came, a larger crowd. Well, I said, well, I want to have a state convocation every Sunday. And I want I want the church to grow like God showed me. It didn't, one church in seven locations didn't happen overnight. It was a big vision. It took time for it to happen. And now that it has happened, well, the thing about it is uh, I'm still waiting on the, the, the others, the, the other ethnicities to come. Yeah. But the thing is, is that it's the power of God that will draw them, the anointing, mm -hmm. uh, that will them, the healing power of God of, of what the gospel will do to people will draw them. So sure, it's not yeah. my personality. It's not even my ingenuity. It is actually the anointing of God that will draw the people and then have them structure in place. Yeah. You know, teams that have been, because no man can do it on his own. Right. I have a team of great men and women uh, that helped me. I can't do this myself. We're team players. We, we, they, in those, during this pandemic, they supported, they gave me counsel. God gave me the vision, but they gave me counsel how to work the vision. And so yeah, I, I'm, sure, I'm yeah. a more of a manager and I got several leaders under me that, that know a lot of things about a lot of things from us, from my secretary to my co-pastors, to, to everyone that's associated with the ministry. Yeah. I have great leadership. Plus I have a bishop Bishop O.L. Meadows, I'll give him a little throw out there, is that he knew that what God was giving me was different from others. And he said, son, I trust you and I know you will not take it to the wrong level. So I'm going to trust you with what God has given you. And now with that freedom, I was able to do what God has called me to do. That's good. One one uh, one of the question that, that I happened to come across was that some people were talking about, I don't know if it's sarcasm or but at any rate, when you talk about growing church, it must have came in late because we're not talking numerically. We're talking about church health. If the church is healthy, strength is attractive. When the church is yeah. healthy. But some of the caveats that you have to be concerned about in church growth is everywhere you go that demands finance starts on time. I'll say it again. Everywhere you go that demands finance starts on time. There's a That's strong capacity for people uh, to say, well, you know, my church is not doing this, that, and the other. But if your church starts at 11 o'clock, you can't open the doors at 11.15. Come on, there. <laughs> you can't, you can't. And then further exasperate the idea because some people are coming to your church who are used to timeliness. So they get there at 11 and, and then service will start to 11.45. And now they get ready to leave because they've been there with three children. Yeah. <laughs> You can't penalize people for being on time. Oftentimes, you refer to somebody being late, they're dead, the late so-and-so. But I digress. Right. <laughs> Chris, if I can chime in on that, because I I, uh, I try to uh, admonish or help pastors establish scripts, service scripts, right? And you, of course, I get a lot of kickback. Oh, well, that's going to block up the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost is not going to have his way. What do you mean? No, 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 no. I, I, I totally disagree. Because in my opinion, the pastor shouldn't be, if you will, the enforcer of the script. He may set the script, but you got to have one of your deacons or brothers or someone you're going to make your uh, like operations person. Yeah. That person will control and harness your, your script. And what I mean by a script is it's an outline. Sure. What happens when we start on time and it keeps you in a timely fashion? I've seen that tremendously bless my church. I've been utilizing that scripted format. Uh, our service is about 90 minutes, and we're very effective. And you come on, you can see on our lives, it's very spiritual. It's high energy the whole night, but the script makes it work. Of course, you got all the other gadgets that go in there, but yeah. Yeah, from I mean, me, from Pastor, Sam, I'm, Pastor Sam, I'm messing with you. I, I, I know you do it. <laughs> That you the Church of God in Christ, but ninety minutes. You sure that's Church of God in Christ? Yes, sir. <laughs> Listen, my bishop is the Bishop J. Bruchier. Oh, okay. Timely. Timely. I got it now. Oh yeah, no, Bishop Shield is very timely. The presiding bishop. Yes. Is me. The presiding bishop. Yeah. Now we, we know we 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 laugh about that, but that is a critical church growth killer. Yes. Mm. yes. That is because yes. sometimes you can have people come to church who are really uh, committed. They have a fidelity to your ministry, but they're time poor. That's right. That's yeah. right. Maybe a CEO or run a company or, 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 or an entrepreneur and they're time poor. And if mm -hmm. that's not considered, you can lose valuable people and penalize them because 
uh, we don't value time as we are. Absolutely. And hey, absolutely. Mission, we should have all learned something through this pandemic uh, about time because we found <laughs> out through our programming, we had to cut the fat. We need to go back to what we came out of. We should have learned right. something. We had to cut the fat. <laughs> <laughs> we have read these programs. I also want to say something uh, concerning what Pastor Moore shared about the secret shoppers. When I was a bank manager, bank president, that was something we did. I was manager of one of the largest uh, banks in the state of Kansas. That's something we, we would send secret shoppers in. Sometimes we don't want to face the fact of, where, of the truth of where we are and what we're doing because we think we have it all. We need to, we want to attract others and other cultures and other peoples. We need to look through their, their lens, their views of how they see us. Sure. Is there something that we need to change? Sometimes the truth hurts and people can sit in our service and tell us exactly why they're not coming back, why they're not right. taking their children, why they're not a part of our, our service. So that secret yeah. shoppers, that's something that corporate America uses and it works well with them. And we need to adapt some of these principles that can help us uh, even on the spiritual yeah. level. I agree. You know, one thing, another thing, if you're watching, please take these notes and you can you can play this again later. But be open to surveys. Yes. Yeah. Be open to surveys. Yeah. Not to, you don't have to put anybody's name. They can they can fill out the, the survey online and you're going to get a real uh, 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 sonogram of your church. Yes, sir. Yeah. But a sonogram is going to show you the insides of your church. That's and good, Bishop. And that'll help you. It'll help you. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. You know, I was my uh, my sister Brenda. She insulted me. I was almost insulted. Not really insulted. When she came to our church when we first started, she said, "You guys are really structured." I said, "What?" <laughs> you know, I thought that was an insult because I didn't know the church was supposed to be structured simply because we had a church program that that people knew what was coming next. That's right. <laughs> they, didn't have to, <laughs> they didn't have to wonder. I mean, to I mean, this is going a long time. They know what's next. But yeah. another thing I want to interject, Bishop, is that um, there has to be some kind of connection the way of what we teach and, uh, and, and preach, but the voice of their leader has to have credibility. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, they, it has to know that they are hearing from God you can be a great teacher, and and they still don't feel like they've heard God, and I think that we as it's it's simple to do just go go to God and 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 get off of YouTube trying to learn from somebody else that way, and, and get before God no, and so, Lord, I true. need a word for your people. You know, uh, I mean, my wife uh, before marriage, she came to my office and and uh, she she was watching me pace. She said, "Why are you pacing?" She said, "You do this all the time." I said, "No." I never take for granted. I don't care how good of a preacher I am or how many times I've preached. I know that somebody's life is depending on what I say. Right. So I try to hear exactly what God wants them to hear so they can be healed. Because God told me that the church would be like a hospital because people could come and get healed mentally, physically, and spiritually. And, you know, pastoring is different than being uh, evangelist. That's right. Mm -hmm. Yes. And some of the people that may be watching tonight, you may not be a pastor. And you may not understand this dynamic. But when you pastor, God gives you an anointing to speak to the people specifically that he's given you to be under shepherd over. Right. There's some things you can say pastorally to your local assembly that you don't preach across the country or it's in your mm -hmm. portfolio. That's right. I mean, every pastor in the fivefold ministry, the apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, and teacher, uh, pastor and teacher is always connected. Every pastor's got to be able to teach. Okay. Yeah, to be able to teach. That's right. That's I right. Mean, preaching is the the preaching of the gospel. The declaration uh, of the good news is imperative. But then you have to make disciples by your Bible study. People, the Bible says that that, that uh, we're 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 not to be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of our minds. So my transformations are going to come from my nous, is the Greek word for my will, and that's when the pastor comes in, who's not throwing food like an evangelist. Mm -hmm. Right, right. The spoon. Mm -hmm. Come on, Bishop. Yeah. 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 The poemen, the rock, the one who feeds with the spoon. You let, come on, sir. You'll taste it before you give it to somebody because you're like, <laughs> I got to live with this. Right. Yeah. Very hey, 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 Bishop. Thank, thanks for sharing. And I wanted you something we talked about earlier. I would love for you to address, uh, and that is um, developing men in the church. Yeah. Uh, but 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 before you go there, I wanted to just share one of my experiences talking about timeliness, uh, uh, Pastor Moore. 
Um, I have I have some some high energy professionals, business owners, CEOs, and a lot of times I'll miss them. They'll be traveling or whatever, and especially during the pandemic. And and so I was telling them, I said, well, it's online, and they said, Pastor, I've been meaning to get to it, but it's hard for me to carve out two hours or carve out a minute, hour and a half to to really sit down. And I was getting ready to go in on them about, you know, God gave you 168 hours in the week. You can't give them two hours. And I was getting ready to go in. And then they said, I normally go and get like this daily inspiration. Mm. And the Holy Ghost hit me and said, well, why come you can't give them that? Right. And wow. I, Bishop, and I do this now five days a week. I take yeah. my sermon that I preach on Sunday and I break it down in the five minute segments and give it five days a week. That's and right. I've developed about uh, 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 three to 400 uh, uh, followers per day that now come up with a five minutes to live by every back day. Up, back up and uh, repeat how you did it so, so pastors can hear about the, how, take the message and- I took my Sunday morning sermon. Yeah. And I broke it down into five minute segments. Yeah. Uh, one day I come on, all I do is talk about the intro. The next day I come on, I talk about point one. The next day I come on, I talk about point two. And I give it and I keep it to five minutes. I call it five minutes to live by. The intent is to give a daily inspiration to people That's based right. upon the word that I'm preaching. And then I can direct them back to the full sermon but to those that are on the run, instead of me criticizing them, well, why can you can't give God two hours? I just came where they were. Because right yeah. now, where they are is, I can give you five minutes. Yeah, and, right. so, and complain about it. I just gave them five minutes. Right. And eventually, I'll get them back to the to the hour yes. wow. after two hours. Wow. And, and, yeah. and that's something. And like I said, I'm, I'm looking on there. And we get probably a couple of hundred, 300 views every day, five minutes a day. Yeah. Uh, but they're wow. getting the sermon in little bites. And then I went and put it on um, podcast. Yeah. Somebody can sit on the podcast yeah. and they can yeah. listen to yeah. all of it while they're driving. Yeah. This I is wow. this the is church pastor, uh, our church is 45% male. And uh, yeah. one of the things my wife said to me, uh, who was my help me, she's my isha. She's my appropriate partner. She's the one who fits me. She said to me, she said, babe, you got to make sure that people have something to do. Mm. And uh, traditionally in the church, in the church, Church of God in Christ, and a lot of Pentecostal churches, um, women would testify giving honor to God who's ahead of my life. Thank God for the pastor, the bishop, the, the chairman of the water carrying committee, the deacon chairman, everybody <laughs> got honor except their husband. And, I, and it, it, didn't, it didn't rest well with me. And I went back to the scripture. This is a true story. I went back to the scripture and, and the Lord said, I didn't set it up that way. He said, the head of every woman is the man. The man is the Bible. The head of every man is Christ. The head of Christ is God. He said, so when your wife testifies, Roderick, he said, she should say, giving honor to God and to my husband, who's the head of my life. And I got challenges. I mean, people were challenging me about it all over. But the truth of the matter is, he doesn't have to be a saint head to be the head. He's the head by default, according to Genesis chapter three. Now, what happened was men were getting honor and getting respected. And every man wants to be celebrated. No matter how mm. old he is, no matter how 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 disconnected he may appear, but he he by nature he by nature wants to be celebrated, and there's nothing wrong with that. That's good, Bishop. You're right. And the brothers would come, and I would say, "Don't ever go home and tell your husband, uh, your boyfriend, how good I preached, because you're putting me in competition with you." <laughs> tell him what Jesus did. All uh, the I right. love that. He yeah, did all right, but the word of God was there. Mm. It, it shifts that spirit of competition. It shifts it all over. And it changed the game for our church many, many years ago. It changed the game. Okay. Well, you Bishop, uh, uh, what about the uh, the challenges that uh, a lot of pastors face with personalities um, and the way things are done? We've done it this way or whatever. Um, the thing about it, what what we do, at every location we have, we have the vision in front of them and they know where, what's next. Mm -hmm. um, the, the vision, though, can't be just a good idea. Some good ideas work and some don't. Yeah. Um, and uh, But if it's a God-generated vision and you begin to tell people what God said is going to happen and those things happen, it brings credibility, 
but it also silences the criticism of those who are set in one mode of thinking. What are some of the, the challenges that you guys have had with the uh, uh, thinking that's so boxed in that you can't even maneuver or get something to move for you? A lot of small churches yeah. have that problem. People, we're, we're Christians will have it. We like to sit, sit in the same seat. One lady in our church, we first got one of our locations, we got some pews and and and, and then the members bought a pew and one old lady, uh, I didn't know she was like this. She, and she was sitting in the same seat every Sunday. The problem is that one time somebody's going to sit where she was sitting and she told him, I bought this pew. I bought this pew. I said, mother, no, your pew was back there in the second one from the back. <laughs> so, so what I'm saying, I'm really asking the question yeah. is, is uh, the mode set of, of uh, boxed in thinking, uh, how, what, how do you guys, I challenge it with vision. Uh, so we can have a clear direction. We can all focus on something. But what do you guys do? Bishop, can I chime in? Absolutely. Thank you, sir. So I, I look at your question as being a fixed mindset versus a growth mindset. And so I totally agree with you. I think a lot of times as pastors, what we end up doing, uh, Pastor uh, Superintendent Nichols, I'm right with you, sir. We're throwing tactics. We're trying to be duplicates of what others are doing. When it comes to events, we talk to guys and, hey, man, what worked at your church? I'm going to try to do it at my church. But I look at the term vision and I, I then apply this term strategy. Mm. What is what is your church's strategy, Pastor? And, and in fact, you know, I think one of the takeaways you have from this session we're having today is if you don't have a strategy, grab, make sure you establish that. Get a strategy communicate it to your team the bible says they run with it when they get it they run with it when they, but you got to stay consistent so yeah. i recently uh uh if you will redevelop my strategy by the way your, your strategy needs to be readjusted about every six months so i re i uh, readjusted my strategy because i found out when i surveyed my church that my church didn't really have an effective evangelism uh let's say culture when did you when find out? Out? when did you find out I found out that we did not have when a, when oh when I found out about uh, about no what, what did you do that made that happen? Great question. What I did then is you did a survey. You did a survey. Oh yeah, yeah, absolutely. Well, I did a survey. I did a survey. Absolutely, yeah. no doubt about it. By the way, guys, I heard, I saw a question on the uh, Facebook. They wanted to know where you get a survey done. There's several ways you can do that. You can use technology. You can use a, 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 a survey app. monkey. You can use yeah, survey, survey monkey. monkey. Absolutely, Please. constant contact has it. Uh, I um, uh, you can use a texting service. A little small little picture. Yeah. I have a texting service that can help you. <laughs> that too. Hey, well, wait a minute. Wait a minute, Pastor. Wait a minute. But this That's is called strategy. The toolbox. This is a part of the toolbox. Okay. So, yes, sir. You know, this is a part of the church growth and development toolbox. You'll be able to reach out to us through our website, through our Facebook page. And talk about tools you need and this is a this is a critical component sure 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 i do that in fact at my church we have a qr code and that triggers the survey for the person so they don't ever have to touch that said i did that survey as you said past uh, bishop and what it did it just showed me that the temperature of evangelism in my church was awful it was lousy so i had to you know strategize to get the temperature mm. people telling others about jesus yeah. And it has caused a vibration, a momentum in my church, uh, a, a, a organic move because I, con I concentrated on that strategy. And that's the thing, pastors, you cannot allow uh, what other guys are doing to derail your focus. Stay right. focused. What is your strategy? Stick with it. You know your church. Yeah. It's Winston Churchill said to improve is to change and to perfect is to change often. That's good. Good job. I used to I used to have people that I would want to point to do something, and the Lord let me know. Where's Crystal? Uh, people are coming to church with worth, not mm -hmm. just to work. They're coming with worth. Instead of telling people what you want them to do, find out what they want to do, then you'll click into their passion. Mm -hmm. You know, and 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 I can chime in real quick. I'm sorry on that. Then and Bishop Gilkey, you'll go right after Pastor. I'll make it very quick, Bishop. On that. One of the things that we have too, I'm very tool oriented. If you guys haven't noticed as of yet, uh, assessments just like Dr. Watson, we have a survey that helps identify 
not a person's spiritual gift, that worth you just talked about, Bishop. It gives, it helps them, helps us see what they really can bring for us as a volunteer. Man, it's life changing. So thank you, Bishop. Uh, before Pat, Bishop Yoki, before you speak, um, someone asked. They said they they would love to make this available to all their pastors by emailing it to their database later this week. So, uh, Pastor Moore, you're going to have to show us how to do that at the end of this session. Yes, sir, uh, Bishop. Bishop Yoki. <laughs> Since we're speaking on navigational strategy, I'm reminded of our ministry was merged. Uh, my father's ministry was conservative, considered old school. We were cutting edge, but we were we had holiness and. The merging, we had to have a strategic plan of action, which can work in with any ministry. Number one, you need to lay out your goals, uh, adjust your priorities, uh, notify your key personnel, bring them together. We're talking about strat being uh, strategic. You got to allow time for acceptance. I'm trying to kind of speeding through this. Uh, they just head into action, and you got to expect problems. There are going to be issues that are going to arise up, regardless of how good your plan is and always point to your successes and, and review your plan. Uh, it has worked out for us. Uh, people were surprised that we were able to bring those two types of ministries together. So it's about having a strategic plan that you can navigate through and being very strategic in your, um, in your planning with your vision. If I can wow. jump on that same question from you, uh, Superintendent Ellis, Ellis, and a great question. Um, to me, the two keys is vision and knowledge. The Bible says where there is no vision, the people perish. And then he said, my people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge. Yeah. So number one, we got to have a vision. If we don't have a vision, then we're going to perish. But then I can have the vision, but my people not know what the vision is. Right. You know, I'm just saying, well, y'all just follow me. Y'all just follow me. <laughs> you know, no, you got to give them knowledge. Right. where there's no knowledge because people need knowledge. And so I try to do check-in meetings with my yeah. congregation. I keep that vision. I remember when we just started, we was in a storefront, but they saw the big picture. You know, I tell all of my young pastors, I, I, I don't care how small you are, just be excellent and let people see the vision of where you're going and then communicate it. I think Pastor Gilkey, I believe he's talked about giving people positive knowledge. Show them your successes. I tell every man, I say, we going to fail, but your wife got to see you. You got to do something now. You got you got to hit something right. You, you, you got to show some success. And as pastors, we got to be able to get those testimonies. We got to show those successes and then move on to the next. And so God has suffered us to do that. That we, you know, I got the vision, and sometimes I shift it. Sometimes I adjust it. I change it around. I make a hundred and eighty degree turn. But yeah. then I start seeing the success. I give the people the knowledge. Uh, I got a big meeting coming up this week. I'm going to drop some knowledge yeah. on where the vision is, where the finances coming out of this pandemic. I think everybody's dealing with that. You know, I got, I got to go in. I got to see well, who I got now. I don't know who I got. Uh, uh, and, and so I got to get a vision out there. And we got to give them knowledge on where we're going short term, long term. I think that is most important. At some point, Bishop, I, I hope that we can talk about money. I know we're running out of time, but I'd like well, to before we before we shift it though, uh, Pastor Watson worked as, as one of the executives in the Billy Graham Crusade. You're talking about having vision, having global crusades reaching millions of people. Uh, Pastor Watson, can you talk about that perspective of of keeping the vision in front of people. I know it piggybacks off of Superintendent Ellison's question, uh, 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 keeping the, the vision systemic. Uh, one of the things that was uh, just of most interest to me, the average tenure of a manager at the Billy Graham Evangelistic Association was 15 years. Corporate, yeah. America, corporate America says, you know what? I'm gonna ride this train for two, three years. And then when the next one comes along, I'm going to jump off this one and jump on the other one. And I think when you when you can find a way to get people connected to the place where they're totally committed. You know, one of the scriptures, uh, I believe it was uh, Pastor Moore, where he talked about, I'll make you fishers of men. The next verse says, and they immediately left their nets That's right. and they followed him. And I think what the challenge is with a lot of, of uh, ministries is the commitment. We have to find a way to get our people committed to the vision. 
And I think that's the secret sauce. And of course, we all know that it's, uh, you know, the anointing, it's, you know, in, in the house, it's yeah. a good, solid biblical training. But I know that in Mark, I think it's three and 14, where it talks about, he said, and he ordained 12 that they should be with him. Yeah. You have to spend time with your leadership team. And it has to be different than your midweek Bible study. You have to have training time where you go away with, and I don't necessarily mean yeah, yeah. You just have to spend that time. And That's it's fine. an investment on everybody's part, but that was what the, the Graham organization did. Now they had the money to take us, they took us for a week to Florida. The the, the leadership team and their wives. Yeah. Our churches don't have that, but you can find some time to separate yourselves. Um, have some specific strategies and specific um, elements of the vision where you can actually break it down, explain it to them, have them ask questions, you give them feedback, but th there's got to be a foundation. Yeah. If you don't have the money to take them, if people value their assignment in ministry, they'll make the sacrifice to pay. Be mm -hmm. We do want to shift it, though. Uh, 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 Pastor Nichols talked about, can we talk on the finance piece? Mm -hmm. uh, and then we'll, we'll shift it to the finance. I want to add two things concerning the vision. I think it's very important that every church has a mission statement and that the people understand what the mission of that church is. Just like in, I keep talking about corporate America, but they made sure that we understood what the mission of that organization was. And also we're very guilty in our church of assigning people to positions and giving them titles with very little training. Uh, we're putting them in management positions and they have never managed people. And so I'm just piggybacking on Superintendent Nichols and Pastor Watson that it's key that we spend time training these people. We wonder why it's not working. They don't have training. We're giving them high level management positions and mm. they've never been prepared to work in those areas. To lead. And the thing about it is sometimes you have people that can train better than you can. Mm. That's true. That's well, good. Yeah, that's yeah, about people. having security. If you if you're secure enough, exactly. you'll 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 employ. That's why I have Bishop, can I say this real quick too? Don't be afraid to onboard outside talent. Mm -hmm. Don't be afraid to onboard outside talent. Sometimes uh, an executive pastor may not be at your location, but it'll be at another lo he'll be at another location, and he can aid maybe running those meetings and things like that for you it, it, as you. Uh, uh, are growing and yeah. you know sometimes Bishop I, I think uh, I always thought that well at first I thought that I had to be smarter than everybody mm. when I found out I had so much wisdom around me I began to not not be intimidated by the wisdom because you, you, nobody can take being a pastor from you right. uh, you wow. have to be secure and to, to let other people uh, lead to let people can do things better you can't right. Do it. Take their advice. I was telling my co-pastors even yesterday, a couple of them, I told them, I said, look, guys, I said, God showed me all this, but it was your wisdom and the wisdom of the counsel that others gave me that got us here. You know, I have a vision, but there had to be a strategy to get the vision. God didn't give it all to me, but when I heard it, I knew that was it. Yeah. You know, Superintendent, um, I... Um, you know, I do a lot of training on relationships. And one of the things I learned, the people that's at the top are not the smartest people in the world. Right. They are the people that know how to get along with the smartest there people. You know. That's right. <laughs> See, what Kennedy uh, was one of the greatest presidents, but who he, it was who he had around him. Right. That's right. You around yourself with that makes you great. That's right. Additionally speaking, the church had become or has been the only place where you can serve and don't have to be trained. Mm -hmm. People let you practice yes, publicly. <laughs> you practice. publicly. You know, what, if you have to go to your if your 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 primary physician or your uh, mm. uh, they have a gynecologist and you say well stop by Walmart so I can pick up a couple scalpels because I you know I'm a, this is gonna be my first time. <laughs> He's insane. So we have to really value the idea of of in of, of, of impartation Yes, sir. Uh, in service training. Uh, let's shift to uh, finance. Um, and particularly, uh, Superintendent Nichols uh, wanted to get into this. And what were the questions and or the concerns and focuses that you wanted to touch on? 
So Bishop, for me, now we have a, a, a annual budget of about $2 million, uh, for our church and, and um, community development corporation. And I'm able to do a lot of things. But some of the churches that I am the superintendent of don't. And one of the things that I know, the Bible says money answereth all things. And I, I think I heard um, Pastor Sam say everybody's a volunteer, but there are certain things that, you know, you got to be careful because you get what you pay for. And, um, and you get what you do. <laughs> <laughs> and and uh, one of the things that I did as a superintendent, because, you know, I, I started saying, OK, this is what I need to do. This is the cost. I set those monies apart. As a superintendent, I began to instill that in my pastors. We set up a every every quarter. I give out a two thousand dollar grant to my district pastor churches, uh, to some of the younger churches, because uh, uh, they have to present a plan to me. Uh, uh, they have to tell me what they're going to do with the funds. But I want them to understand that marketing requires money, advertising requires money. Getting that vision out there. The Bible says, how can they preach except they be sent? Sometimes I can't send you across the country without no money. I, I can't do these things. And so I need them to value and understand that money matters. You got to manage money. And I didn't manage it very well for a while. But I praise God, I figured that out. I was blowing through money, but you need money. You got to learn how to get money. If you don't get it, you got to work on getting it. Yeah, you because do. The money answereth all things. You can have the greatest message in the world, but if ain't nobody hearing it because you can't get it out, it don't really matter. You know, every, every church should consider, this is what we practice, and uh, every church should consider having an, an internal audit and an independent auditing firm. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, in our church, we have an internal audit and we have mm -hmm. an independent auditing, auditing firm. Now, we employ people, so yeah. people yeah. Get, they get health benefits, vacation, and we have investment retirement packages that are available. But everything is contingent upon the budget of the ministry. But I think if, uh, if pastors um, understood the significance of an audit, it's very important. It's not about trying to get your money to pay to the IRS. It's about letting you see uh, a SWOT analysis, your strengths, your weaknesses, your opportunities, and your threats of what you can and cannot do. Because sometimes your vision to be in greater in value than your finance. Sure. And so some things you have to do in phases. But if if men here's a here's a here's a good practice that we share. And I and I've shared this with pastors all over the country. Learn when you do your tithe and offering, separate them. Don't do them together. When mm. you put tithes and offerings together, you're not discerning one from the other. They become tithe or offering. That's good. That's good. That's good. And the Bible says tithe and offering. But if you don't discern the difference, neither will people. And mm -hmm. tithing, you return, but an offering is what you get. I mean, just a little fundamental principle like that increases your budget without you taking up a thousand offerings on a Sunday morning. You, you know, that's a key thing uh, is that how do you receive your money? Uh, one thing I learned that a lot of pastors prostitute their people. Yeah. Mm. Uh, they let evangelists come in and, just, and, and receive offerings and you know that guy hadn't heard from that. Uh, and some, <laughs> but, but you know and sometimes they really are. Now sometimes it's really of God and 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 the heart. But if you keep doing that too many times, uh it it, it damages the way people perceive in giving. They think that that the prosperity is a one shot deal. And yeah. so if I give this yeah. thing and I don't tithe an offering, yeah. that, that I'll, yeah. that I'll have to do all that. So I, I, one thing I learned: don't don't prostitute God's people. Absolutely. Absolutely. Trust God's way. Hey, Bishop, somebody said they they heard my comment about the two thousand dollars they joined in my district. My <laughs> my email is. <laughs> 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 Bishop, I, let me chime in if I can uh, on that because I also agree with doing an analysis of your ministry uh, of the financial components, but I also feel that we can resource share as well. Um, and, uh, and when you, and you look at different means in your church, not everything has to be paid for in the sense of it being financed. I pay superintendent Nichols. I pay with my time mm -hmm. in building that individual so that they're where I need them to be for performance for my ministry. So well, you, um, you go on. 
I'm sorry, Bishop. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. So, yeah. So it just, you know, as you're talking with others, you will find out. Like, for instance, I, I, my church was going so rapid. It was an issue. I, but my finance wasn't catching up as quick. So hmm, I needed a data, database. Where my church was, I needed a larger database system, which was going to cost me budget beyond what I was able to pay. Let me just inject. Let me, let me just interject right there. Now, he made a, a statement that is really... It's, it's, it's kaleidoscopic. <laughs> he said his church was growing, but he didn't have the finances for the, for the church growth. So in reality, his church wasn't growing. Well, yeah. His attendance was. Oh. And, this, and, this is, and this, is, this is where people get discouraged because they start looking at numbers in their church and you can have 500 people there and, and only 5% even give. Mm. That's good. That's right. So, you know, and that's why I, want to, I really want to reemphasize for all of us on, on, on this team that our thing, church growth and development, church growth, we're not talking about evangelism. That's a different department in the church. This is about church growth and development. This is a construct on how to, to keep what you catch, how to manage it. You brought up a good point. I don't know if you meant it intentionally or whatever, but it's a good point because some people will see 100 people coming in, but the 100 people that came in, have more need than they can help meet me. Mm -hmm. That's right. Right. That's right. And, yeah. But you know, Bishop, let me chime in yeah. on that because I think before people begin to really invest of their substance financially, they want to make sure that you're going to be stable. Are you going to be consistent? Are you going to be around a while? So they're shopping you. They're looking. They're checking you out. They're checking them. You, you go and buy something at the store. You're checking it. Make sure it's all there. No strings. I, that is my experience. And uh, so that's what I meant by the catch up. About yeah, I get it. I get it. Yeah. yeah. And so then what I did, let me. Uh, and so I had to do some research. I had to do an analysis and see. OK, I found a service that was in my budget, but still provided uh, what I needed. I guess what I'm saying here, all the resources in terms of the money may not be available, but it didn't mean that God didn't provide the resource. Sure. You may not have the money. He still provided the means to be able to get it done. You're going yeah. to have to dig a little bit. You have to work a little bit. And it's there. Technology sure. certainly can help. You, you, know, you know what helps finances a lot in the church? It's when you do what you say you're going to do. That's good. Money. Right. Uh, if, yeah. if you're raising money for something, it should go for only that. Right. And they should see a result of what you have they've sown into, and when they see that, that establishes yes, credibility, and people give when they know what you're doing is what you said you were going to do. That's you know, right. Right. Businesses fail for two reasons: a lack of knowledge and a lack of capital. What did you say? What did you say, brother? I mean, businesses fail for two yeah. reasons: businesses a fail. lack of knowledge and a lack of capital. You either don't know what you're doing, or you don't have enough money to do it. And when I, one of the things that I, I learned was number one, that you got to get knowledge on what we're doing, but you got to have resources and finances. And, and I don't know if any of you all do it, but I teach finances at our church. We, yeah, have, Dave, we have Dave Ramsey classes because people got me money. Yeah, they may be spending it on Netflix and Amazon.com and, and, and Walmart. And so when you ask them for a $20 off and they look at you like you're crazy right. uh, because Walmart got their money last night. But <laughs> if we can teach them the basics of finances, then I find out church people don't have a problem giving when they have money. They just get mad when you keep asking and they ain't got none. See, sure. one of the problems is, you know, you, you said you teach finances in your church. And there's, a, there's another arm of Christianity that teaches prosperity, as a prosperity gospel. Mm -hmm. and if you can't preach it globally, you shouldn't preach it locally. Right. Mm -hmm. what, you, what we really should focus on, scratch that. Um, what, what, I, what I suggest uh, as a pastor that has worked. I like. I love to play golf, and I got a book called "How I Play Golf" by Tiger Woods. So he <laughs> said in the book, uh, "You don't have to play like me." He said, "If you see what I'm doing, if it can help you, then I'm successful." I'm just telling you, brothers, I'm telling the audience how I play golf. <laughs> All right. We play yeah. stewardship. We teach a lot on stewardship. That's good. This talks about a good name is rather to be chosen above silver or gold. That's your beacon score. You should be able to get more with your name than with your bank account. So when you practice stewardship and you're faithful over a few things, God will make you rule over many. 
that's how that's how things come. The Bible talks about finance um, here a little, there a little, uh, bit by bit. Uh, it, it's, it's over and over again. But if you have people who think uh, I don't have to practice stewardship, I put my cell phone in my in my cousin's name, and my my gas bill is in my dog's name, and and you're trying to beat the system, that that's 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 non integritous And so when you practice stewardship. Uh, when you're faithful over a little, God says you'll be faithful over much. If you're unfaithful over little, you'll be unfaithful over much. And that's where money you know, comes in. You'll see how much people love God by how they handle their money. Mm -hmm. You know, Bishop, uh, uh, in our church, I'm so glad that you mentioned that about the financial piece, because in our church, uh, co and his, one of our co and his wife came to us, and they had been successful with what Dave, uh, Dave Rams had, had, had presented, and they became debt-free, and they wanted others in the church to have the same thing. So I sent my children through it. I, I uh, uh, the church went, many members of the church, and they come out debt free, understanding the principles of giving. See, I don't think everything has to come from the pulpit. There's different ways that we can educate the people of God spiritually. So, and that's some, yeah, there's some things they should hear from us, but sometimes it's even go farther when they hear from the the ones that are in the pews or the other the other people of the, of the flock that actually this has worked for me. And uh, and it, it'll work for you, and this is how it's done. So I think, uh, uh, you know, they think the pastor's supposed to know everything. No, pastors don't know everything, but we, we're connected to people who might know everything. A brilliant pastor knows what he doesn't know. Mm. <laughs> <That's> good. <laughs> and help, we need for that. Yeah. <laughs> We got 10 minutes left. We got 10 minutes left. And people are asking, I'm, they said, oh, we're waiting for part two of this. Uh, <laughs> now, let me say this. Let me say uh, this is the toolbox. And this toolbox will be operating throughout the country and in our national church and in some of our national conventions. Uh, this, this church growth and development team is a part of that. Pastor Derek Hutchins II uh, lost contact. He was, he was traveling. And that's why he's, he, what, he lost contact with us. But he is a part of our team. Yes. Uh, so I don't want anybody to, to miss this. Yeah. We got about uh, yeah about ten minutes left. We want to field some of these questions. Then we also want to address some of the holes where you have where people are doing the best they can uh, and they're not experiencing church health. They're not experiencing mm -hmm. church health. May I submit to you something on the floor that we preach healing, but we don't preach health in the sense of diet, mm -hmm. and exercise. Mm -hmm. yeah. and so we can't even. We can't even enjoy the perpetuity what God has for us because we have a life based on temporary satisfaction. But let's get into that. Yeah, I'm extreme. Uh, I get up 3.20 every morning. I'm at the gym probably about uh, 3.40. I, I, I work out for a couple hours or more. Uh, I eat uh, good some days. Some days I don't. <laughs> but the thing is, is that um, uh, I heard somebody say this years ago when they were talking to T, uh, Bishop T.D. Jakes. They said, we have to be in shape for what we're assigned to do. Mm, that's good. Um, uh, good. And so, because what we are assigned to do is so strenuous, and and really, when you walk or run or lift weights or whatever you do, there are certain chemicals that's released in your body that relaxes you. And so, when I exercise every day, I'm not exercising just to be healthy, but I'm also it, it helps my mind, it helps me think. But that uh, makes you healthy. Yeah, makes you healthy. Exactly. 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 There is a neurosurgeon who said he analyzed 10 pastors and he gave them CAT scans. He said all 10 pastors had post-traumatic stress syndrome mm. wow. as though they had been in a war. Wow. And he interviewed them and said, have you been in the military? military? They said, no. Have you been a police officer? No. But the one string of, 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 of continuity that they all had, they were pastors. Mm. And that shows wow. They, 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 was, they was like Moses. Lord, these people you gave me. <laughs> <laughs> you know, Bishop, um, uh, that's been a big thing for me. And, and uh, I, I, I tell people to think about life and, and God is God, the Father, Son, Holy Ghost. We are body, soul, and spirit. Our pastors, to me, I look at them as the ones who are primarily for our spiritual man. But then you got your physical man and you got your emotional man. Um, you know, and, and I tell people, I said, you got to work on all three of those. Sure, sure. Uh, what the Bible said, beloved, I wish above all that thou mayest prosper, be in health, 
even as thy soul prosper. Yeah. And so we, you know, uh, it, it, it's a shame that people are on their way to heaven, but they're no earthly good because they don't take care of themselves. They don't eat right. We look at the disproportionate number of people who died from COVID-19 in our community because of comorbidity, because we didn't have good health. And uh, I do something in my church called willpower, where we exercise, we lose weight. Um, um, was, and, that, was, that a, was that a pun? Was that a pun on words? Willpower. It, it was. Yeah, yeah, came yeah, up yeah. with it. It was the exercise group, and I asked the church, "Give me a name for it." And somebody <laughs> said, "Willpower." I said, "I love it." I love it. And um, but my point is, is I keep the people conscious. I got different groups that yeah. challenge each other with exercise eating habits and all of those types of things. And then I tell people, go see the doctor. And, 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 yeah, and this be, again, this may be taboo, but Bishop, I tell some of the people, go talk to a therapist now. Yeah, uh, I, I give you the word of God on the yeah. spiritual side, yeah. but there's some things going on emotionally that you might want to check out. You know, when you've been abused, all of this, I know we can pray and lay hands, but no, there's no. Some things that's going on in your oh, soul. Trauma. Yeah. That that people that that are better at dealing with that than me. Yeah. It's, and it's and so let's not ask the pastor to be a psychologist. I agree. I, 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 I got a confession to make, brothers. You know, my my wife has, has she's been vegan for many many years. She's a Zumba instructor. Uh, I mean, exercise. And she and she changed my diet. But I said I'm gonna eat what I want to eat. I'm a I'm, I'm an omnivore, so I'm not doing that. <laughs> we went bike riding, and she left me about three blocks behind. Oh, and I'm puffing! I'm like, this is the devil. Ain't no way in the world she should be beating me on this bike. Because <laughs> <laughs> you know I'm, I'm doing my push-ups and sit-ups and stuff. But then when my diet changed, um, it, it revolutionized my life. Mm. I, I, I kid you not, it revolutionized. She would always say, she she said, "Baby, if you eat something dead, you got to eat something alive." Oh. It's got to be something live, like greens, and and it changed my life. And she 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 bad. She's she, she's doing her thing, and mm. uh, fifty five, and uh, no slowing down. She's still you know, mm. and we've talked about health often in our in our local church. That's wow. good. My wife this, embarrasses this, me. The statistics have not changed for years. Seventeen hundred pastors still leave their church every month. Oh, wow. Statistics have not changed. 3,500 people across the country leave their leave church a day, mm, a day. Wow. They just, I'm gone. Wow. And that's just statistics that have been studied. And we're talking about this, but this is happening. Um, if it's happening um, in Barner's group, it's happening in the Church of God in Christ as well. Pastor Watson, isn't it, isn't it 1,700 pastors leaving a month and only 1,500 starting? The, the, so it's it's less less starting. Yeah. It's going backwards, yes, sir. Less pastors are starting the pastor than 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 are quitting. Than are quitting. Mm -hmm. That is correct. That is correct. Wow, we're not replacing. Let me tell you why. It is because um, it, it's it's both spiritual and natural. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, because uh, and mental there's and a devil that we have to deal with as well. And, and uh, what was it? What was it? I said there's a devil we have to deal oh, with yeah. as well. And he works against us. And Paul warned us of those things, especially when you're making progress and when you're uh, going ahead. You know, uh, I was I heard about it's a church in our city uh, that uh, they they uh, it was a young man got up and started growling like with a demon in him, and, and the pastor said, I'm sorry, but we don't believe in that. Sit down. He said, Okay, he sat down. <laughs> <laughs> True story. <laughs> the thing is, if you don't believe in nothing, evidently, though, he wasn't demon possessed. The guy said, "Okay." He said, "Okay." He said, "If you don't, well, if you don't believe it, that, that I'm here, I can do what I want to, and just fine." You know, I, I, I don't want to your service. But the, the thing, the thing I'm saying is, is that there are some spiritual aspects that uh, a lot of uh, people don't know they're up against you know yeah. they, they, they got witches you get all kind of uh, Jezebels, yeah, sure. uh, in, that that's rooted and grounded in the and these people uh, like Jezebels what I mean by Jezebel it's the spirit of Jezebel Jezebels yeah. in the Old Testament are then addressed again in Revelation and those the spirit of control that talks behind people 
Those yeah. those people are like in your prayer meetings, the people that you think supporting you sometimes in that prayer meeting. They, they love to pray. They love to control services. Mm. So what I'm saying is, you know, the reason why some of this is happening is because of spiritual uh, forces coming against us and not knowing how to yeah. battle against that. Well, you know what? Fasting produces clarity. It doesn't does. make you spiritual. It enables you to see. Every doctor has to have a private fasting life, not just the prayer life. Amen. Amen. You know, but prayer and fasting, fasting produces clarity. Brothers, our time is up. We have to schedule by demand, by popular demand, we have to schedule again another mm. general form. We, this was our introduction. We wanted to show people uh, uh, what the vision of Bishop uh, J. Drew Sheard is. Yes. And uh, we're trying to articulate that vision uh, from a healthy, uh, uh, safe place perspective. And I, I pray that they, if they get an opportunity to watch it and, and get all you can and can all you get, uh, it, it'll be a life changer. So I want to thank God for you all being a part of this tonight. Um, and we're praying for those that are on, pastors that are on here tonight. Uh, it is true, it is true. The virtual church, the V church, the E church, it is a part of life. Some people will never come back to church. And if you don't make the adjustment, if you don't make the adjustment as a new wine church, New Testament church, you're going to suffer the consequences. But I want to thank you, pastors, superintendents. Thank you, team. Uh, it's been a powerful time tonight. And uh, I think we need to do it again, brothers. Absolutely. Can't wait. Hey, Bishop, can I throw this out? Because I said sure. something, my wife embarrassed me. I want to make sure I get that straight because I live here. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, my, wife, <laughs> my wife, we call her Lady J, but she is the one we talk about exercise. It, it helps because she is one that eats right. She eats nutritional stuff and it helps me adjust to that. So if you can partner in that, yeah. you know, because she embarrasses me, you know, in the, on the treadmill, she runs backwards and sideways and oh, well, I, I have to run straight. But, yeah. but what I'm saying is, is that sometimes it helps if you partner. And I, I want to say this also, uh, Bishop, your leadership in this has been tremendous. Yes. Thank you for giving yeah. us opportunity to share with others what's really needed in the forum, forum and I believe it's going to be a blessing to to the body of Christ. Amen. Amen. Praise God. I receive that. Uh, Bishop Gilkey, why don't you whisper a word of prayer for those that are part of this? We have quite a few people on tonight around the world and uh, pray for the success of church growth and development that we might empty ourselves of the toolbox to make ministries better. Well, God, we bless you. We praise you on this evening. We thank you for this opportunity to come together to share with pastors and leaders all over the world. We pray that you bless the presidium of our church, our presiding bishop. We thank you for the leadership of Bishop Hennings on this evening. We pray that we will have healthy churches, physically, mentally, socially, financially, and most of all, spiritual. God, we bless you. We thank you for great success for this area of ministry. And we thank you for great leadership once again in Bishop Hennings. Be blessed in Jesus' name. We thank you for good, great, and Amen. awesome success in the name of Jesus. Amen. 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 God bless you. God bless you. God bless you all. Bishop, uh, let's say to all of those who want resources and the things that uh, we shared tonight that they'd like follow up, hit us, follow us on our Facebook page, guys, uh, Church Growth and Development, Facebook at Church Growth and Development Kojic. Follow us there and we'll be sending uh, posting and things of that nature. Make sure you uh, stay connected. Absolutely. Amen. God bless you. All right. God bless everybody.